Here's how to save images from GIMP and use them with the Adafruit GFX library. It's a quick and easy technique for creating images for an OLED or TFT display. I should just mention the images are only saved in monochrome. The graphics library does let you choose which colour to display them as though. Before you click away and watch funny cat videos instead, I'll add that you can use them to make colour composite images, like this battery indicator here. They're also great for sprites and logos. It's not quite so good for photographs. If you do need to display full colour images on an OLED or TFT display, then watch this video instead. So here we are in GIMP and this is the first image I want to use on the ESP32's display. So as I said in the intro, it's really not amazingly good for photos. However, if you do want to use a photo, I found it's better to invert the colours. So you can do this by going to colours and then invert. So you have to trust me on this, it does look a bit weird here, but this will actually display much better on the screen. I should also mention that you should also resize the image. So the screen I'm using is 128 pixels by 128 pixels. So that's what size the image is. So to save the image, you need to go to File and then Export As. So we'll put our file name in here and just make sure that you save it with a .xbm file extension. The way GIMP saves things, it depends on what file extension you give it. So we go to Export. It comes up with an options screen, but I've not used any of this. I don't think any of this is that useful. So now we will click on export. So that's how to export photos, so they'll look not too bad. What about the Space Invaders or the graphics like the battery surround? So for these, it's best to use a monochrome, i.e. black and white image. So here is one of the Space Invaders. An important thing here is that again, you might need to go to colors and then invert. So you might think that this one will work best with the display. In fact, you have to go to colors and invert. And then it's the black that takes on the ink color when you use it with the graphics library. So again, we can save this one as a .xbm file. So you can see that the files have been saved as XBM format and that's associated with the GIMP package. What we need to do is to open them with a text editor. So I'll open Space Invader 1 first. So you might have expected to see some image data. In fact, we have a piece of C code which we can use in the Arduino IDE. The first two lines are really useful. They will give the image width and the height. So that's quite useful to know because it's not immediately obvious from the data. This is the image data, and it's saved in 8-bit format. Now let's look at the sketch in the Arduino IDE. If you want this code, there's a link in the description. So I have two files here, a regular sketch, which has our program data, and the image data I've put in image underscore data dot h. The image data can be quite big, especially for the pictures, so I thought it was best to put it into a separate file. So let's look at the image data first. So as you can see, this is the data from the XBM file. So all you have to do is to copy this bit and paste it into this file. You'll also need to give it a name. I've also changed the data type to uint8. Another important thing is that you must use progmem here. So when you're copying and pasting the XBM data, ensure that you put this attribute in here. This is a throwback to the Arduino Uno origins of the IDE. So while the ESP32 memory layout is a lot different from the Arduino, the Adafruit graphics library requires that data like this is stored in progmem. So as you can see, this file is quite long and I put in all of the various images. So this is the Mona Lisa. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of data there. So it's much better to put this into a separate file and then keeps the main sketch clean. So let's look at the main sketch now and see how to render the various images. So starting at the top, we put the screen width and height in. As I said before, I'm using a display that has 128 pixels and it's a square screen. Next we include the two graphics libraries. We need the Adafruit GFX library 
and the SSD 1351 library. This one is the library specific to our particular type of screen. If you try to compile the sketch and it says the libraries are missing, you need to go to tools and then manage libraries and you can search for them and then you can install them. SPI.h you should have as it's part of the ESP32 distribution. The following line I had huge problems with. So this is the image data include file. If you're using your own include file, then you need to encapsulate the name in double quotes. So note it's using double quotes here and not the angle brackets. That really confused me. Also, this file has to be in the same folder as the .ino sketch. You can also go to sketch and then add file. So you can add files this way. So next we have the connections for the pins. So this is the wiring diagram. You'll need to connect up the screen to the ESP32. The ones in bold are really critical and you must use these pins. The CS, DC and RST pins can be connected to any digital pins. So you don't have to use zero, two or four. You could use other pins if you're already using them. But again, the ones in bold are absolutely crucial. Your screen won't work if you don't use these. So back to the sketch and I've defined a few colors here. So a few standard colors. They're in RGB 565 format, which is a bit of a strange format. But if you want to add other colors, you can go to this link here. This is a really useful website. So all you have to do is to click on the color here and choose a different color. So if we wanted purple, just click on that, click on OK. And the one we want, I think it's this one. Yeah, so RGB 565, it would be this color here. So we could put define purple. So this is what we would use if we wanted to use purple. This line here initializes the class that initializes the screen itself. So that puts in all the various settings. Next, let's look at the setup. There's not a lot here. I should mention that if you want to rotate the screen, you can uncomment this line. You can set it back at any stage in this sketch as well. So this is quite useful if you want to mount the screen in a different orientation. If you want to print debugging information, I've also included the serial port output here. So you can go to tools and then serial monitor to monitor the serial port. So the images are displayed within a loop. So they'll loop back to the start again and loop through our demonstration here. So the first one I do is the battery. And unlike all the other ones, I've rotated the screen for this one. Just really demonstrates what happens when you rotate the screen. So the TFT class has a lot of methods for drawing on this screen. A really important one is fill screen and you send in the name of a color. The way the screen works is that new images are put over existing ones. So you might need to call this fill screen before you put another image on the screen. So to use the images from GIMP that are in here, all we have to do is TFT dot draw X bitmap. So this will draw a bitmap that's in XBM format. So the draw X bitmap function requires six arguments in total. The first one is the X coordinate of where to put the image. Second is Y. Third is the data itself. Fourth is the width of the image. Fifth is the height of the image. And finally, the last parameter is what color to use. So this one draws the outline of the battery and this call draws the second battery. You can of course plot text on the screen. So this puts the labels on the screen. So for the battery animation itself, instead of using bitmaps, I've used tft.fill rect. This draws rectangles on the screen. So obviously this is much more memory efficient than actually importing a rectangle shape. So there's the red one, the orange one, orangey green, and finally green. And this one is for the second indicator. The next one we look at is the Mona Lisa. So again, it's important to clear this screen if you're putting a new image on top of an existing image, unless you want to make a composite image. So because this one is full screen, we start it at zero, zero, 
and it's 128 by 128 pixels. Again, as I stated earlier, it's better to invert the data. So the inverse one, which is shown in yellow, looks a lot better than the green one. Next, we have the battery data images. This is a kind of nice demonstration of how the graphics library dithers images. So they look okay, although I think I would reverse the colors and they probably look a bit better. Another example here, this is the bar chart and it doesn't look too bad actually, although I would probably use rectangles for the data. But again, it has dithered them and they don't look too bad. This function called draws the YouTube logo. Again, I prefer to use composites like I did with the batteries, so I think this one looks a lot better. What I've done first is to fill a rectangle with white and then put the bitmap over it. Finally, we have a way of making some rudimentary animation. So this is the Space Invader, and basically all it does is to draw Invader 1, wait a bit, and then it draws the second one. Just remember that you need to put a black rectangle over the image before putting the other one on. Otherwise you just won't see the animation properly. If you want to use the screen to make a game, then you can look at this YouTube video. This is a kind of Donkey Kong mock-up that I've done. You might also want to check out this video as well. This shows how to display full color images on an OLED screen. So I hope you found this tutorial useful. Thanks for watching.